and welcome. You're watching the news track. I'm Rahul Kamal. Through this election campaign, the big question has been, can the BJP hit the 370 mark? I'll flip that question today and ask conversely, can the Congress be so par? Can the grand old party hit the triple digit figure? What goes in favor? What goes against? Electorally, how strong is the Congress at the moment? Is that even possible? All that and more coming up on the news track. पूरा देश कह रहा है अब की बार हरके जी भी कह रहे मोदी डिक्लेयर्स मिशन 400 पार प्राइम मिनिस्टर सेट्स टारगेट 370 फॉर बीजेपी अलायंस वॉर इरप्स बिफोर पोल्स Can Congress gain from alliances? Atma Jyotiba Bhuleki Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Ki Can Congress hit a century this election? State of War 2024 Big focus on news track we have some fascinating data insights coming up on the news track tonight. Before I dive into them, let me take you through the headlines I'm tracking this evening. PMK kicks up a storm with its election manifesto. MK Stalin vows constitutional changes like curtailing the power of governors and removal of CAA. BJP hits up. Big suspense over Varun Gandhi's Lok Sabha constituency. Sources say he may fight solo if he's denied a BJP ticket from Uttar Pradesh's Pilibhit. Samajwadi party extends an invite, says they're ready to induct Varun. Rahul Gandhi's Shakti Bar snowballs. BJP moves the election commission, claims Rahul violated the model code of conduct, demands an unconditional public apology and stringent action. Double murder horror in Uttar Pradesh's Badayu. Throats of two children slit over money dispute. Killer Sajid dead in an encounter. Hunt on for accomplice Javed. Prime Minister Modi speaks to the presidents of Russia and Ukraine on the phone. Sources say both Putin and Zelensky have invited the PM to their respective countries after ports. The Prime Minister is out with his war cry of char so par for the NDA and that's his big idea. The BJP gets 370 seats, the NDA he hopes will end up 400 plus. But uh, I want to flip that question and say the Congress which has just bought 50 seats in the last Lok Sabha elections, can it double its telly? Can it get to uh, triple digits? The BJP war machine is in top gear, stitching new alliances, bringing in new partners. The Congress, though, won 52 seats in 2019 and at this moment hopes to get past the 100 mark. And in just a moment from now, I'll try and explain why that may be much easier said than done. Here's our lead report tonight. The campaign inching towards its climax. Seeking a third consecutive term, the Modi government has confidently declared its objectives. On the other hand, Congress has refrained from publicly setting any goals. There's speculation this time around whether the opposition party will secure 54 seats. The minimum required in the Lok Sabha to qualify for the leader of opposition position. Or face failure for the third time in a row. A review of the numbers from 2019 and the current situation 
with allies indicates that Congress is confronted with a significant challenge ahead. Pura ka apka, pura ka pura paisa. Adani Ambani, Adani Ambani, Adani Ambani, Adani Ambani. Five years ago, contending for 261 seats, Congress won 52 and came second in 209 others, securing a 19.7% vote share. A closer look reveals that there are only 51 seats that the party has consistently won two or three times. With 24 in the south, 13 in the east, 12 in the north and 1 in the west. However, there are as many as 183 seats that Congress has won just once in the last three elections. 60% of the seats Congress won in 2019 were from Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Punjab. In Kerala and Punjab, Congress allies, the CPM-CPI and the Ahmadmi Party are in competition in 2024. In Tamil Nadu, Congress is allied with the DMK. The bright side of the dissolution of the AIA-DMK-BGP alliance, which makes things comparatively better. In 2019, the BJP won 224 seats with over 50% of the vote share, while Congress only secured 19 such seats. Congress maintains similar alliances to 2019 across 98 seats in Tamil Nadu, Charkhand, Kerala and the Northeast. However, in Gujarat, Goa and Haryana, Congress's partnership with Aam Party is largely symbolic. In Uttar Pradesh, a stronger BJP in the post Ram Mandir scenario presents a significant challenge. Opportunities in Bihar and West Bengal seem less politically lucrative, with the Janata Dal United exiting the India bloc. And the Trinamool Congress going solo. A swing analysis indicates that Congress could secure 97 seats if it gains a 5% vote share across seats at the expense of its nearest rival. In the worst case scenario, it could be left with only 21 seats if the party loses 5% of the share to its closest competitor. Bureau Report, India Today. Throughout this election campaign, the question that's been asked is whether the BJP can hit the 370 number. But we're going to flip that question and just look at it from the other side, from the opposition's perspective. Can the Congress hit the triple-digit figure? It was at 52 seats in the last Lok Sabha elections. 54 is the bare minimum required to hit the 10% number, after which the Congress gets designated the uh, party of the opposition. And you can have a leader of the opposition. So therefore, can the Congress hit the three-digit number, 100 seats. To talk about this, we're joined on the broadcast by Supresh Rinet. Uh, Supresh Rinet is the chairperson of the Social Media and Digital Platforms Committee of the Congress Party, squaring off against her. Sanju Verma, national spokesperson of the Bharatiya Janata Party, with me in the studio, our consulting editor and India's former television journalist, Rajdeep Sardesai. Rashid Kidwai joins us. Rashid understands the ins and outs of uh, what's going on at Tenjanpat and at uh, the Congress headquarters. And Amitabh Tiwari, joins us as well. I want to go across first to Rajdeep. Rajdeep, everyone's talking about 370 par, and I'll just put out the data in a moment, but on the face of it, given what we've seen so far, do you think the Congress has what it takes, enough oil in the tank to be able to hit the triple digit number? Look, Rahul, uh, you're absolutely right. Much of the media hype has been around, will BJP cross 400 uh, char so par? But I think the real story of 2024 could well be, will the Congress cross so par? Or will it even cross sat par or 60 par? 
because unless the Congress is able to grow, the opposition cannot grow. If the opposition cannot grow, it's game, set and match to the BJP. And it's not just one election now, it's been two elections. You win 44 in one election, you win 52 in the other. So the Congress has a long way to go. As of now, I see only three potential states, Rahul, where the Congress is clearly in a race to be double digits. One is Kerala, the other is Telangana, and the third is possibly Karnataka. Outside that, that critical Hindi heartland, especially in those 150 odd seats where there will be a direct fight between the Congress and the BJP, we've seen in the last two elections, 95% of the seats have been won by the BJP. So unless that changes, Rahul, how does the Congress cost uh, uh, even uh, 50 or 60? Remember, Rahul, last time round, the Congress got eight seats from uh, uh, Tamil Nadu where it was in alliance with the, with the DMK and it got... 15 seats uh, from uh, Kerala, uh, where it was, of course, uh, fighting the left. So half of the Congress's seats came from these two states. The question, therefore, is which are the growth areas? Can the Congress grow a bit in Maharashtra now that it's in a stronger alliance? Can it grow a bit in Haryana, uh, where there could be an element of anti-incumbency? Could it benefit from an alliance with the Samajwadi Party in UP? These are all big question marks. But at the moment, Rahul, to answer your question, I think the Congress is facing a huge challenge to grow from 54 and it reach at least cross 60, if not cross 75. Because if the Congress touches 100, and that's my last point, if the Congress touches 100, then the BJP starts coming well below 250 and then you have a potential game in this election. But that doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. At least that's not what we gather from the ground or indeed from the pollsters. Let me take our viewers through some data from the 2019 Lok Sabha election which gives you a base level at which this election begins because where you ended up last time is really the starting point of this election. So let me take you through that and then we'll go across and ask our guests whether the Congress can hit the 100 figure. So let's go one by one. I'll take a look at how many seats the Congress and the BJP uh, had what percentage of votes in. Remember the Congress has 50% plus votes, seats where they got more than half the voters voting for them in only 19 seats. The BJP has 224 such seats. Uh, the Congress had 40 to 50% of the vote in 76 seats. So if you add both of these, there are about 95 seats uh, where the Congress has 40% plus votes. The Congress was between 30 and 40% of the votes in 113 seats. So the Congress really has a fighting chance essentially only in the 95 seats where they had 40% plus votes because that's where they came close to taking on the BJP but not necessarily beating them in these seats. And 30 to 40 are seats where the Congress can think, okay, if we work really hard, we have a chance because we have 113 seats where the vote shares between 30 and 40, not enough to convert but enough at least to be in the fight. So let's go across to Supriya Shrinath on the first visualization only 19 really strong seats where you've got 50 percent plus votes 76 seats where you got 40 to 50 percent plus votes uh, and 113 seats where if you work really hard you have a chance but from what most people who are watching at this broadcast would assess the congress in their opinion wouldn't necessarily have been seen as being working as hard as the bjp so what then ma'am gives you confidence that the congress can in this election be so par so pressure So a very good evening to you and all my fellow panelists. Uh, I have two observations to make before I uh, answer your direct questions. India today's intelligence unit has done a very unintelligent analysis of how electoral politics pans out. I think India today's intelligence unit has done this in, uh, analysis sitting in a four by four room looking at a few laptops doing the numbers. This is not how elections pan out. This is not how electoral politics happens. That's point number one. Point number two, and I think it's a very important point that I want to make in my, in your question to me. You said people who are watching this broadcast believe that the Congress most, isn't most. working hard. No, the people watching this broadcast don't believe that the Congress... Yeah, I'm just saying people watching the broadcast don't believe that we are not working hard. Maybe you and your team and other people in, in your group believe we are not working hard. And I'm not here to address your concerns about my hard work. I mean, we are a party where my leader has uh, traversed 
over 10,000 kilometers of this country in the last one and a half years. He's been to almost every district in this country. Uh, he's been to every, almost every state. I don't know what is the basis of saying we're not working hard. I'm not going to argue with you without that, but I just wanted to correct you that it's not the people who are watching. It's people within okay, your Do you want to come now to the so question? What's your strategy? What makes you confident way, that you can end up SOPA? I'm coming to that. Yeah. No, no. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. I'll tell you all of that. I'm here to answer all your questions, but I'm also here to address a few misnomers, uh, infactual information, and uh, loose comments that are being put out. I'm also here to do that. I'm a spokesperson. That's my job. Uh, coming to the specific question that you asked me, I'm extremely confident because when we go on the ground and when we talk to people and when we talk to people about votes and hardcore politics, they're not talking about the issues that I see on India Today or on channels like yourselves. I'm not seeing the kind of debates that, you know, happen on Indian television day after day and night after night. I am seeing very, very relevant issues that people are very concerned about. And those issues are joblessness. Those issues are high prices. Those issues are income inequality. Those issues are horrific crimes against women. And the abject silence and patronage of the ruling class and the BJP and the Prime Minister. So the issues on the ground do not resonate uh, in analysis like these or television studios like yourselves. I'm extremely confident that after a 10-year period of Mr. Modi, and with all due respect to the mandate that he won, it was a brute majoritarian mandate. And absolutely, he won a, he won a stunning mandate. He squandered the opportunity. But Give me words won't win you votes. Modi, My question is based on data. People. If you have to go from 52, you need 48 seats to get to 100. Where will you get these seats from? Respond more specifically than you did just now. I will tell you. No, no, I'm going to respond as specifically as the questions being asked. I will go back to saying I'm a spokesperson. It's also my job to poke holes in some of the arguments that you are making. I will tell you where we will get those seats from. First, the silly argument and the silly basis of this argument is, we will we cross 100 or not? We will be much over that mark. And I will tell you where will we get the seats from. We are going to get seats in Rajasthan. We are going to get seats in Madhya Pradesh. We will get seats in Chhattisgarh. Almost all these states that the BJP had maxed out in 2019 we will win in up and we will the numbers from up will stun you we will win in bihar as far as the north of india is concerned we will win in punjab we will also do well in haryana so i'm not at all i am not sheepishly going to say i don't know where it's going to flow this is where we will win from. okay as far as the south of the vindhyas are concerned whether it's travel okay. or telangana or andhra pradesh or even for that matter kerala and tamil nadu our numbers are going to stun and the reality is that no matter what outreach Mr. Modi and his entire brigade tries to make there, he will end up with a big fat zero. Okay, that's so I want to go across to Sanju Varma because analysis. there are two aspects that the BJP needs to be aware of. One, whether the BJP's campaign peaked much in advance, that Ram Mandir, uh, Pran Pratishtha was the high point, a lot of fervor then. A lot of the opposition camp thinks that, okay, that's the peak from there. There isn't as much momentum as there was building up to 22nd of January. So, therefore, did the campaign peak in advance? B, and I want to show our viewers this, where the Congress has been able to stitch alliances and how is it different from the last Lok Sabha election. So, Amitabh Tiwari and our team did this analysis. We go state by state looking at where the alliances are as strong as they were last time, where they are weaker than the last time and where they are... Uh, stronger than the last time. So, in about 5% uh, of the states, there, there is no alliance unlike in the last election. Remember, in Karnataka last time, the Congress had an alliance with the Janta Dal Secular. This time, there is no alliance on those 28 seats. So, in 5% of the seats, the Congress is in a weaker alliance than in the last Lok Sabha elections. And what could hurt the Congress the most are the 82 seats, 15% of the total. Those 82 seats where they, for various reasons, have squandered the opportunity of being in an alliance. Most importantly, West Bengal, where they had the opportunity of being in an alliance with Trinamool. Uh, they couldn't agree at uh, a seat-sharing formula, Mamta Banerjee walking away because of the repeated attacks from Adiranjan. And in Bihar, where Janta Dal United switched. So these are two big states, West Bengal uh, and uh, Bihar, 82 seats where the opposition and the Congress could have been in a stronger position than they are because they weren't able to get their Alliance Act in order. There are about 98 seats, about 18% of uh, the total 
Lok Sabha, where the alliances are similar to what was the case in the last election. So that includes uh, Tamil Nadu, that includes Kerala, that includes most parts of the Northeast, and that includes Jharkhand. These are the states where the Congress is in a similar alliance to the alliance that existed in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections. That's about 18% of the total vote share. Where the Congress's fortunes will be determined are the 155 seats where the Congress is fighting the BJP by itself. These are states like Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Telangana, Madhya Pradesh. These are states where the Congress is fighting by itself mostly against the BJP. In some states uh, like Orissa and Andhra against local regional players, so about 29% of the seats, 155 out of 543, where the Congress is fighting alone. Last, I look at seats where, frankly, the Congress is in a stronger alliance than the last time. Relative to 2019, in states like Delhi, Jammu and Kashmir, Maharashtra, Goa, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, even if in some states like in Haryana and Gujarat, it's only a notional alliance, there's not much to be had by having that local alliance. But for whatever it is worth, these are 33% of the seats, 180 seats where the Congress has a stronger alliance than it did in the last Lok Sabha elections. Let me put that question to Sanju Verma of the BJP. The Congress can hope, see? On 33% of the total seats in the Lok Sabha, the Congress has a stronger alliance than it did in the last Lok Sabha election. So, while things started out bad, now, for example, Tanish Ali coming in, Papu Yadav coming in, in Purnia. So, there are seats and characters who have entered, which can give the Congress some confidence that maybe things aren't as bad as they were a few weeks ago as this campaign wears on. They may not have enough gas in the tank to win, but they have gas in the tank to do better than what uh, was initially being imagined. Uh, Sanju Verma, respond to that. Rahul, I first want to tell you very clearly at the outset, I did not heckle. I expect that courtesy to be extended. And I heard the monologue from the Congress for a good eight to nine minutes. So please don't try to rush me saying, Sanju Verma, you know, please finish up fast. I will make my points and I will give a pointed rebuttal and also answer your questions. First and foremost, I think India Today's Mood of the Nation poll has done a fabulous job saying that Narendra Modi-led government is coming back to power for the third time in a row. I think you guys do a fabulous job. I'm not going to sit here and play the victim and say, oh, you guys are not intelligent. I think you guys are super intelligent. Now, you know, let me uh, speak on a more serious note. And on a more serious note, I always speak with data. I don't come on television debates, uh, you know, uh, talking rhetoric. I tell you what. The states where BJP is supposed to have maxed out. And people say, Kere, BJP ne yaha to baat kamal kar diya tha mein. Now, they face an uphill task. I will tell you something. Gujarat, Lok Sabha 2019, BJP had a 62% vote share. Madhya Pradesh, BJP had a 58% vote share. Rajasthan, BJP had a 59% vote share. Haryana, BJP had a 58% vote share. Jharkhand, BJP had a 56% vote share. Uh, Uttar Pradesh close to 50% vote share. Now, mazhe ki baat ye hai. Why did I name these states? I named Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Jharkhand, what have you. Because while the BJP in all these states had more than a 50 or 55 or close to a 60% vote share, the Congress did not fare poorly when it came to vote share. In all these states, the Congress had a vote share of either 30%, 32%, 34%, or even 35%. But Maze ki baat ye hai. Madhya Pradesh mein, Rajasthan mein, Gujarat mein, Haryana mein, despite having a vote share to the tune of 32 or 34%, the Congress was not able to capitalize on that. In Rajasthan, we won 24 seats. The only other seat went to Hanuman Beniwal's party. Okay. In Madhya Pradesh, the only seat went to uh, Kamal Nath, uh, you know, the Chindwara seat. In Haryana, we won all the 10 seats. In Gujarat, we won all the 26 seats. Even in Chhattisgarh, we had uh, won 10 seats out of 11 in Lok Sabha 2014. And we won 9 seats in LS 2019 from Chhattisgarh. So what is the first point I'm making? My first point is simply this. The ability of the Congress to translate vote share into votes and into winnable seats is absolutely downhill. They have lost that art to do so. 
पॉइंट नंबर टू आपने कहा यू नो पप्पू यादव आ गए हैं दानिश अली आ गए हैं ओ क्लैप 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 नाउ आई विल चल यू विच इज द स्टेट आई कम टू उत्तर प्रदेश बेयर विथ मी आई वॉन्ट बी वेरी वर्बोज विच इज द स्टेट विच सेंड लार्जेस्ट नंबर ऑफ सीट टू दी लोकसभा आफ्टर उत्तर प्रदेश इट इज महाराष्ट्र एट फोर्टी एट सीट एंड आई कम फ्रॉम मुंबई महाराष्ट्र आई टेल यू समथिंग वाई इन महाराष्ट्र वी विल डू एक्सीडिंग यू वेल ओके द रीजन बींग द रीजन बींग We have today the Nander Bahubali Ashok Chavan with us. A couple of years back, we got Narayan Rane, the Konkan Bahubali with us. We have today with us Dilip Valse Patel, who was earlier in the Sharad Pawar camp. He is a seven-time MLA from Ambe Gao. Then we have Sunil Tatkare and Aditi Tatkare, the Bahubalis of Raigad. We have Dhananjay Munde and his cousin Pankaja Munde, the Bahubalis of Bead with us. Then we have Sanjay Bhansore, the Bahubali of Latur Marath Wada with us. So, कहने का तात्पर्य ये है, if you have Nander, Konkan, Marath Wada, Latur, Bead with you, there is no way. Okay, in hell so you made two important points. Now, I want to so, put those questions to Amitabh Tiwari. One second, ma'am, I'll come back to you. I, I, you, ma'am, you've spoken for four minutes. How is that not enough time? I want to go across to Amitabh Tiwari. I'll come back to you in a moment. The two points. Sanju Verma makes which are important points. One is that the BJP has tactically plucked from the opposition leaders like Ashok Chavan, who can potentially help in particular seats like in Nanded, and they've done this in different states. Secondly, in seats where there's a BJP versus Congress head-on-head -head fight, the gap between the BJP and the Congress is so much that even if it looks like the Congress had 30 percent or 35 percent, or even in some cases 40 percent of the vote, because those are bipolar contests, it isn't enough to win. So, if the Congress is to win in those seats. It will take a lot of unrest, a lot of anger, which needs to be visible on the surface for that gap to switch and for the Congress to come up on top. Do you buy that? Can the Congress be so far in your view? See, essentially, for the Congress party to cross hundred seats, it will have to defeat BJP in the two hundred odd BJP versus Congress direct contest seats. See, all Congress was in contention only in half of the Lok Sabha seats. So uh, almost 260 to 261. That is winner and runner up. Out of these, three fourth are against the BJP, and one fourth against regional parties. Of the 190 odd against the BJP, the strike rate was less than 10 percent, and the vote share gap is more than 20 percent. So for the and in the uh, contest against the regional parties, the strike rate was just above 50. It won 37 of the 71 seats. However, this time, this time on 25 seats, which is Kerala and Punjab, the so-called friends of the Congress Party are threatening to reduce the tally of the Congress Party. So this is the Congress versus Regional Party. In the Congress versus BJP contest, it has to defeat BJP and has to have a swing of at least five percent. That is five percent gain from the BJP. Towards the Congress Party, then only it will be able to touch the hundred figure mark. So the entire contest, not only the Congress BJP, but the entire contest of the election lies in the results of these one ninety seats. Okay. And on these one ninety seats, on one fifty plus seats, BJP had a vote share of more than fifty percent. Okay. So, so I want to do two things. Time. I want to do two things. You know. When it comes to strong and weak seats, just how many strong seats does the Congress have? Uh, Supriya Shinde said, as a party spokesperson, she doesn't believe in this uh, laptop-based data analytics. But frankly, that's how analytics happens. You look at base files, you do projections on base files, you look at electoral strength because that's the last available sample. How you perform in a particular happened. election in the last election? So I want to do that right now. So. Uh, let's show our viewers how many weak and strong seats does the Congress have at this moment. Remember, this is a party that's ruled our, our, our country for a large part of its independence. At this moment, out of 543 seats, the Congress has 309 weak seats, seats which the party has never won in any election for the last three elections. Classified as a weak seat. Now, this is a mind-boggling number. Such is the electoral state of the Congress at this moment that on 309 total seats, the Congress has 
never won in the last three elections. Just bring the entire graphic up, please. Uh, on 183 seats, the Congress has won only once in the last three elections. So these are relatively weak seats. Uh, relatively weak seats, seats which the Congress has won only once in the last three elections. It has only 51 strong seats, seats which they've won uh, twice in the last three elections or all three times in the last three elections. So only 51 strong seats, seats which you think, okay, here's a seat which we are almost likely to win or maybe just lose by a small margin. But 309 seats, and that's where I want to go across to Supresh Nanit because, ma'am, frankly, no matter what you say on television, this is how all election planning and strategizing is done. And the, the extent of how much of an uphill task revival for the Congress is brought out by this number. 309 seats where the Congress hasn't won uh, in the last three elections. One, a one-time formidable pan-India party now reduced to only 51 seats which you can classify electorally as being strong seats. So Rahul, first up, I don't think I need a lesson in how analysis and analytics work. I did that for about two decades of my life. So thank you very much for explaining me how it works. I know that a little better than most other people do. Uh, as far as the weak or the strong seats are concerned, and quite frankly, what I wanted to say, and maybe you did not... Perhaps I couldn't put it across as well, or maybe you chose uh, to ignore the import of my argument is that electoral politics is done very differently. Electoral politics materializes on the ground. You know, 5% swing here or there is not a big thing. When you say, and I, I was hearing somebody talk about the Congress versus the BJP. Well, we were up against the BJP in Karnataka and a very formidable BJP. We reduced them to a pulp. We beat the BJP to a pulp as far as uh, Himachal is concerned. We beat the team B of the BJP in, in Telangana. So it, BJP is not, you know, it's, it's not invincible. It's not a formidable competition. These are, these are grandiose words. I don't think it's such an uphill task, quite frankly. I think issues on the ground, I think the work that we are doing, I think the yatra that uh, Rahulji has done, I think all of these factors do add up. Please understand one thing. Electoral politics is a lot more about chemistry than about arithmetic. I mean, I can turn around and exactly throw the same data at an, anal uh, you know, at an analyst or the BJP spokesperson and say, if you are so formidable and if you're in such a powerful position, <laughs> why are your sitting MPs quitting? Why are your sitting MPs and four of them from, from Jayan Sinha to Gautam Gambhir to Jasveer Kaur Meena to I think Sunny Dol, the list goes on. Your sitting MPs are not willing to contest elections. Your sitting ministers are bidding farewell to the to Indian politics. Why is that so? There is something that's amiss and the something amiss here is that the people are not talking to uh, data collectors, people are not talking their minds on television channels, but they will talk when elections happen. Because there is a sense of fear, there is a sense of a vindictive government that comes after you if you speak too, too often and if you speak too loudly. Okay. Now, too, now Rashid uh, Kidwai, you, you that speak to so many people within the Congress. Like How is the yeah, mood in the Congress when it comes to that Rahul Gandhi Yatra from east to the west, he traversed from Manipur to Mumbai. Um, was it in the estimate of Congress internal trackers as successful as his south to north Yatra or do they accept that it simply didn't generate as much traction as the last Yatra did? Uh, thank you, Rahul. Rahul, I think the Congress clearly believes more in God than in, uh, in data. So therefore, uh, Congress uh, is quite optimistic and they thought that uh, uh, Bharat Jodo Yatra phase one and phase two would increase Congress vote share from 19% to 23, 24, 25% of vote. If that happens, then Congress will definitely get 100 or, or more seats. As Radhik was saying, that as long as if Congress gets 100 Lok Sabha seats, then the BJP will not be able to cross on its own, stand the 250, 300 or whatever that kind of mark. Key point is whether these two yatras are going to increase the vote share. The sea water uh, that mood of the nation it clearly showed it is not crossing over 20 percent. That means the Congress is in somewhat trouble. But then Rahul, that does not mean the Congress story is very dismal. It depends upon how you know what kind of candidates are uh, fielded. You look at Telangana. The Congress had 28 per percent of votes. It jumped to 39. Uh, per 39 point some percent of votes, 11 percent increase. If Congress does that in, let's say, theoretically speaking, in the 300 seats, then it's going to make a qualitative difference. But the big difference between Telangana and the rest of the country is that there was palpable anti-incumbency against K. Chandrasekhar Rao and people wanted him out. And therefore, 
they voted the Congress, which seemed to be the party which could uh, change the government and come to power. And is there that level of anti-incumbency? Uh, Suppression, it seems to think there is. Everyone who's watching will have their own view because Morning Consult and several other trackers show Prime Minister Modi is amongst the most popular leaders in the world at the moment. Not just Indian polling, but global polling suggests that as well. Tracked. Rashid Kidwai. Yes, uh, so Rahul, uh, we have talked about this. You see, Prime Minister's uh, popularity of 60%, 70% doesn't convert into votes. If you look at the BJP tally, again going by 2014 and 19, then it's 31% and 38%. So it's not. Uh, I'm saying that there is always a problem if we take the previous election as a benchmark. 24 is a is a standalone election. Okay. Let's see. No, but happens. listen, listen. Can I just say, no matter what people say, you take the data from the previous election as the benchmark because that is your starting point. Everything happens on that. But the point that Supriya Shrinath is arguing, and she has some merit in that Sanju Verma, is that just the base files mean nothing because if there is anger and there is anti-incumbency, a party which is set to be finished like the Congress was in Telangana can spring back to life. The Congress in Telangana was out in the wilderness. You know, the BJP was the emerging force, the BRS was the ruling party. And suddenly, because the BJP campaign didn't do as well as the BJP would have wanted, and the Congress had Revan Reddy, they built a snatch campaign, the Congress bounced back. That's Rahul Gandhi's big hope, that the Congress is in India's DNA, and it can bounce back. If there is anger and anti-incumbency, it can bounce back. So just that we are strong on 50 seats means nothing. The Rahul Gandhi and the Congress can think at any point in time, if there is anger, the voters will vote the Congress back to power. Respond to that. Sanju Varma. The question was so lengthy, Rahul Kaval, and I think you know you love being bullied. The more you are bullied, the more disproportionate time you give to a panelist. But I am not going to bully you because I am not a defunct Congress. So let me be very clear. I reinforce. You guys are doing a great job, and you are super intelligent. Now you repeated one word again and again and again and again. There is anger. There is anti-incumbency. There is anger. Are you kidding me, Rahul Kaval? We won Madhya Pradesh. Ma'am, I didn't say there's anger. Don't put words in my mouth. I said the Congress will think if that. there is anger, like there was in Telangana, that defunct electoral machine can spring to life. Voter jita sakte. That's my question. Don't misunderstand or misconstrue what I said. Sanju Verma. Rahul, please, you know, first and foremost, stop talking so much because you need to give me time to rebut. I was coming to that, that it's not you. Don't start jumping the gun. You are not Rajdeep Sardesai. You are Rahul Kaval. Thank you. So let me now say this to you. Your statement, anger, anger, anti-incumbency, anti-incumbency, your statement as in your statement about what Rahul Gandhi said. Okay? Kush. Now, let me say this to Rahul Gandhi's sympathizers, empathizers, and everybody out there who's pinning his or her hopes ki bhai, is baar, tisri baar Modi sarkar nahi, shayad Congress aajai sakta me. I want to say one thing. Madhya Pradesh, we had almost a perceived Two decade old anti incumbency. We had one of our best performances ever at more than 163 seats. Rajasthan. Kya tha ke ki hai? She said, Oh, all this talk about lawlessness in uh, you know, Rajasthan under the Ashok Gehlot regime is all balderdash. Ashok Gehlot is coming back. Hamara share Rahul Gandhi wapis aega. Aapka share Rahul Gandhi aur aapke Gehlot sahab ka supra saaf ho gaya. Then in Chhattisgarh, every political pundit work his or her salt said Bhupesh Bagel is coming back with a resounding mandate reduced to 35 seats nobody gave us a chance in hell and we came back with 54 seats the limited point is what did assembly elections 2023-24 tell you in the Hindi heartland that the BJP has converted anti-incumbency into pro-incumbency point number one point number two that you know the Congress's alliance finally seems to be working. In Bharuj, Congress had to cede their seat to Amadmi Party. Once upon a time, okay. this was an Ahmed Patel bastion. Please wait now. Begu Sarai. It is not the Congress, but it is the CPM which is going to fight. Mumbai Northwest. Not the CPM, Congress CPI, is very missed. Can I please finish? Mumbai Northwest. It is something that Sanjay Nirupam was very keen on. Bina Sanjay Nirupam or Congress or Rahul Gandhi ke puche, Uddhav Thakre declared that Amor Kirtikar, the son of current MP Gajanan Kirtikar, will be fighting for Mumbai Northwest. Uttar Pradesh se teen seat se sirf mangi thi, 
uh, Congress say, apart from the other, they said this three, these three which certainly want to fight on Balia, Moradabad, and Bijnor. Akhilesh Yadav ne Rahul Gandhi ko kaha. Okay, so now, now what I want to do is just take our viewers through a extrapolation using the last the Lok Sabha seats as a base. If the Congress were to get 5% votes uh, from the BJP, where does it end up? Because that's the question I'd asked at the start of this conversation. Can the Congress be so par? So if, if in the fights that the Congress is having on different seats is able to pull 5% of the votes from its uh, nearest rival, which in uh, many of the cases in the heartland is the BJP. So let's see how it goes, okay? So the actual tally of the Congress in the last Lok Sabha elections is 52. If the Congress loses 1% of the vote that it had, uh, it comes down hypothetically to 47. If the Congress loses 3% of the vote that it had, it comes down to 33. 5% of the vote, it comes down to 21. Going on the other side, if, you know, it starts uh, to rain good news for the Congress on the 4th of June, uh, if it picks up 1% vote from its nearest rival, it ends up roughly around 63. If it picks up 3% votes from its nearest rival, it ends up at 74. But here's the response. Even in a supremely good case scenario, if the Congress picks up 5% votes, which means that a party like the BJP is coming down 5%, a party like the Congress is going up 5%, so even if that were to happen, the Congress then ends up at 97, very close to the 100 mark, but not quite there, which suggests really uh, Amitabh Tiwari that if the Congress were to go from 50 or to near double its tally, which would require a 5% vote share switch largely coming from the BJP, that would require, you know, about 5% of the BJP's voters to ditch the Congress, ditch the BJP, switch to the Congress. That would require very visible anti-incumbency. That would require like anger, frustration, suppression, it sees it. But do you, do you think this is possible? This going from the 2019 tally to this extrapolation of potentially ending up at 97 if there's a 5% swing in their favor? Amitabh Tiwari. See, essentially, uh, this 5% plus actually translates into a 10% swing. Double, because 5 of the BJP or the nearest rival is reducing and 5% of the Congress party is increasing. And this is what the anti-incumbency vote is, which Supriya ji was talking about. And this could happen due to many reasons, correct? So that's what is, is the chart showing here. But if it's a pro-incumbency vote, the same minus 5% plus 5%, it reduces to 21%. And why is here the popularity of Prime Minister Narendra Modi important, as you were saying, and Rashid ji was also mentioning about because for 37% of the voters in 2019, prime ministerial phase was the most important voting consideration. That's the highest. And the popularity cannot be high when the government performance is poor. So that's also correlated. That's number one. Your MOTN showed that Rahul over Rahul, Modi enjoyed a lead of 41%. It was 55% versus 14%. This means that this factor itself, which is the popularity of Prime Minister Modi, fetches BJP 15 to 16% vote share, 37% into 41% lead, 14 to 40 roughly, 15 to 16%. So it's not going to be easy. It's not improbable. Impossible is policy, possible in politics. But for that, Congress will need to really, really slog in the direct BJP versus Congress contest, where unfortunately for the party, the, its allies have limited or no vote. Congress is on its own in these seats, and that's also a drawback for the Congress in these contests. Okay, I'm running out of time. I have uh, just one final round of comments very quickly from all our guests. I want to come back to Sanju Verma on the concern about the BJP's campaign peaking. You know, in these little nibbles, the Congress is making some new candidates coming in. Like you cited all the seats where the BJP's got... Good candidates, winnable candidates. Now the Congress can say, okay, at least some of them have come to our kitty. And B, whether the Pran Pratishta on the 22nd of January was the peak of the BJP, can it once again build that kind of fervor to have that kind of an epic peak? Because it's Rahul, a very long will, campaign. Rahul, I will just say this. Uh, you know, what is uh, one of our campaign themes? Hum sapne nahi, hakikat bunte hai. Isi liye to log Modi ko chunte hai. 
and why we say akki bar 400 par this is not a homily or a platitude or arrogance or over confidence i always say this is what i learned during my mba days a good product plus good marketing is equal to success which is what narendra modi and bjp are all about a good product but bad marketing is equal to failure a bad product and bad marketing is also failure or congress made bad product rahul gandhi and you know uh, marketing is next to nil because these guys are still deciding kisko kaha se khada karna hai i believe supriya shinet was fielded from amethi but haar ke dar se inhone mana kar diya tapasvi khera ko bola tha varanasi se tapasvi khera ne bhi haar ke dar se mana kar diya i am rohan gupta was about to be fielded haar ke dar se mana kar diya so the so let me ask supriya shinet that question well. straight up supriya there's been a lot of buzz i'm sure you've seen on uh, social media Sanju Verma uh, stirring that question as well is it correct that you've been approached and uh, you are considering or will fight against Smriti Rani in Amethi Suprashne and and with all your journalistic experience you expect me to answer that question on yeah, prime time television I, in India today in India it, it's my job to try and you and I have spent more time in journalism you can keep trying that's your job मन है आपका लड़ने का मतलब बेसिकली यू आर नॉट डिनाइंग द स्टोरी मन है नो नो मन है आपका लड़ने का आई एम आस्किंग आई एम आस्किंग वेरी सिंपल अरे खबर तो दो मन है कि नहीं लड़ आई यू अप इट्स अ ग्लैडिटोरियल बैटल मिनिस्टर स्मृति ईरानी वर्सेस द फाइव स्टी सुप्रेशन इज आई यू इंटरेस्टेड आई यू गेम सी यू आर सप्रेसिंग अ स्माइल the and smile gives a part of the story away the i'm here. asking a straight i'll I come to the next one right. come on no super i'll come to no the no question no. later are you interested in a gladiatorial no. contest with minister because smriti irani because after 20 seconds you will say the time is up no, no answer my question i'll give you more time after 20 seconds you say you have to i won't i won't i promise you i won't i'm no. asking you a question no. answer i will take the 30 seconds to ask a very simple question are ladna ki nahi ladna smriti irani se batao to sahi ab bata nahi rahe ho bihar you nahi nahi aap pehle meri baat suno acha uske baad batao it works अगर इतने परसिस्टेंस से निर्मला सीतारामन से पूछ लिया होता मैं बताती हूं आपको आपने अगर इतनी परसिस्टेंस दिखाई होती जब निर्मला जी ने बोला कि रेड पड़ने के बाद बॉन्डी नहीं खरीदे गए थे आपको उनको दस एग्जांपल्स देने चाहिए थे आपने एक भी एग्जांपल नहीं दिया आपको अमित शाह को बताना चाहिए था कि क्या जितने सवाल मैंने पूछे ना उसके बाद सर्टिफिकेट फ्रॉम यू और फ्रॉम एनी बडी एल्स वेदर वी आस्क क्वेश्चन हार्ड एंड टफ और नॉट आई थिंक आई लीव टू आर व्यूअर्स टू डिसाइड दैट्स नॉट समथिंग दैट आई वॉन्ट ट्रैप्ड इन टू एट ऑल आई अप्रिशिएट योर परसिस्टेंस Rahul I really appreciate your persistence I wish you had shown the same persistence to throw facts back at Nirmala Sitaraman Amit Shah because you did not do it give me 20 seconds to talk now 15 lakh aane the har bank account mein 15 lakh nahi aaye 2 crore rozgar nahi bane army ko bhi theke par bitha diya 4 saal ke liye the okay. reality of this election is going to be decided by the youth of this country the same youth and you will have to give me time because you wasted my time the same youth jinke paper leak kar rahe hain this is just a tactic to buy time come on you spoken for so long when you are supposed to wrap up you're asking for more time sanju verma you bold googly she played it with a self she sanju verma she played it with a straight back you said she is fighting from amethi himmat hai to amethi se chunav lado supriya shinde himmat hai to amethi se chunav lado aur apne tapasvi ke chak rahe ho varanasi se khane ke liye Okay, okay. Let's not, let's not let's not lose cordiality. We had a good no no I want to I I don't like this. I don't like this. We had a good sensible debate for the large part of it. Supriya I'm out of time so just 10 seconds frankly just 10 seconds I'm completely out of time. No, no, Rahul one second. I will take 5 seconds. ये जो मुझे नसीहत दे रहे चुनाव लड़ने की इनको ग्राम प्रधान सरपंच का टिकट देंगे बीजेपी को अगली बार आगे टिकट करेंगे अपने जहां पर This is meant, you know. I like to do data-led shows where the data is doing the talking, but we're also in election season, and this is where emotions often do the talking as well. I don't want to go down. We want to try and raise the standard of conversation uh, to the extent that we can. Nothing is perfect, but at least we try. So, uh, can the Congress get to that three-figure mark? We try to explain to you what could go right. What? Uh, why is it so difficult for it to go from 52 to 97? Given where the Congress has come down to, so it's a much longer exercise. to try and revive the congress and it will take a lot of effort and that effort will be visible if and when it does happen so you've heard from our pundits you've heard from our politicians 
we're not fighting any election. The only election we're fighting is for your trust. And our hope is that we work so hard, we bring you such great content, that you come back uh, to watch us night after night, day after day. The DMK manifesto was released in Chennai by Party Chief and Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M.K. Stalin today and it's kicked up a massive storm among the DMK's poll promises are curtailing the powers of the governor and stopping the implementation of the CAA. Here are the details. Battle lines are drawn in Tamil Nadu. Chief Minister M.K. Stalin on Wednesday released his party's 2024 poll manifesto. DMK vowed to restore Jammu and Kashmir's special status, something which only centre has the power to. DMK also promised to remove CAA, which has been recently promulgated. Stalin even vowed more powers to states by taking away powers exclusively to centre's domain. Stalin's vows to stall issues like uniform civil code may impact ally Congress's poll prospects. Speaking to India today, Stalin said his promises are realistic since India bloc will emerge victorious. Sir, work kill me, sir. Sir, you uh, have a lot of information in the country. Sir, there are central government schemes. So, this is the first thing you have to do with the Indian bloc. You have to do with the team. We have to do with the team. We have to do with the team. We have to do with the team. DMK asserted its manifesto will have a pan-India impact. You have the 64-page manifesto here. It seems more like the manifesto for across India than Tamil Nadu. Because it's an election for across India, it is a parliamentary election. So that is why we focus more on uh, national uh, issues. Manifesto is the sinosure of all the eyes. It is not only the manifesto for Tamil Nadu, for, but for the entire, entire states of India. It has all the progressive announcements that will undo all the regressive laws which have been brought down by BJP. The BJP and AIA DMK slammed DMK's bid to alter the basic tenet of constitution and federalism. BJP asked Congress if it backs DMK proposals. DMK party, if you take back the history, they don't uh, dedicate their allegiance to the constitution 100 percent. They have been time and again uh, going against it, be it a language, be it a regional uh, issues, be it a Sri Lanka issue. So they have never told, to, uh, told the line of the nation. The first initial opinion that comes to my mind is it's a masala manifesto to hoodwink the people of Tamil Nadu. They are the one who said you voted to power an assembly we will get away with meat with just one signature. Then they created a narrative that they have got 75 lakh signatures from the public to get away with meat. That went directly to the dustbin. Now they are again reiterating, saying that if you voted to power, we will abolish meat. People of Tamil Nadu are sick and tired of this hoodwinking methodology of DMK. They are pathological liars. Will DMK manifesto help or hurt the India bloc's poll prospects outside Tamil Nadu? With Pramod Madhav in Chennai and Nagarjun Dwarkanath in Bengaluru, Bureau Report, India Today. This is where we wrap up the news track tonight. For your time and your trust, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you at 8 p.m. tomorrow evening. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. Good night.